Broadcasting live from the great city of Manchester, England. This is the Richie Allen Show on DavidIke.com. It's the Richie Allen Show. Brought to you in association with DavidIke.com. And now, live from Manchester, England... Here is Richie Allen. And it's Wednesday's show. It's the 21st of October 2015. How are you? Hope you're well. Hope you've had a nice day. And you're looking forward to two hours of spin-free news. Well, I say spin-free. I have opinions, of course. I won't deny that. Lots coming up in this particular programme. Coming up in hour one, brand new to The Richie Allen Show. Making his debut on The Richie Allen Show is a man called Dana Durnford. Now, he's a very interesting man indeed. Yesterday, as mentioned on this programme, Japan's Labour Ministry confirmed the first case of cancer connected with radiation poisoning uh, for a former Fukushima employee. Now, Dana Durnford is an adventurer, a sailor. Uh, He's also an expert on nuclear power. And he believes the Japanese government and the world's media are covering up the real effects of the uh, disaster, the environmental impact of the disaster. And I've been listening to Dana talk to colleagues of ours in the United States, and he thinks that the Pacific Ocean is in a state of such decay that it is unfathomable, no pun intended, to the vast majority of men, women and children in the world. So Dana Durnford joins me from British Columbia... It's 21 minutes past the hour. To find out more about my first guest, go to the website, thenuclearproctologist.org. That's thenuclearproctologist.org. He is a fast... Excuse me, (coughs) frog in my throat. He's a fascinating, fascinating man. I mentioned at the top of the programme that he's an expert on the devastating effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. He's also an adventurer. And uh, he's been doing a lot of media recently to talk about what exactly is going on with uh, respect to the attempts to to clean up or to fix what happened in Fukushima. But more importantly, what it's doing to the Pacific Ocean and what it's doing to the west coast of the US and uh, beyond. Like I said, it's the nuclear proctologist uh, dot uh, com, the nuclear it's dot, dot org, the nuclear proctologist dot org. In fact, he's in British Columbia which is a beautiful part of the world. Let's welcome to the programme Dana Durnford. Dana, thanks for taking the call. How are you? I'm good, Richie. I'm really enjoying your vocals, actually. Kind of making me homesick. Ah, you see. <laughs> where, where are you from originally, or where's the family I'm, from? I'm originally from the east coast of Canada, a little place, Newfoundland. Oh, little, God. Little well, yeah, Newfoundland is amazing, because I'm from Waterford City, and you will know this, but many of our listeners yes. won't. Uh, a lot of... The, the, the Newfoundland accent is pretty similar to the Waterford accent. And a lot of people uh, way back when left uh, Waterford, left Cork, left Kerry and ended up in that part of the world. But of course, you right. will know that. Right. Yeah. No, it's a very distinct accent, uh, too, on top of that. And it's just that I don't hear it very often. So I was really, I was really liking it at that time. You got a really strong, really, it's a really nice accent. I know uh, some of my listeners were telling me during the live stream, they don't miss your show. And so I made sure I put that out there so people can find you. And once again, Fukushima, of course, we got 30 minutes, I guess, is it? Yeah, uh, we, have about, we have about 30 minutes, Dana, yeah. So it's a, such a, if most people haven't heard my narrative, uh, you strap yourselves in uh, for sure. It's a very strong narrative and you can't have a conversation about uh, these reactors without sounding alarmist and you can't you'll sound like a fear monger no matter how you try to ease into the conversation. It's impossible to talk about even in the lingo without overwhelming people. And people shouldn't be overwhelmed by something, um, but they are because the misinformation, as you're familiar with uh, how that works in every aspect of our lives, is very strong in the nuclear industry. And for 70 years, they have propagated out a paradigm that radiation fallout or radiation accidents are the uh, equivalent of 
bananas and potato chips and walking in the sunshine, getting on airplanes, uh, dental x-rays. And these things are known as uh, homeostasis, where you can't get any more radiation of that type in your body. Your body regulates you like a car regulates, uh, cruise control regulates a car or a thermostat regulates your home temperatures. Your body regulates it, and it's known as homeostasis. And so when you take that original product, that's homeostasis, and you add it, uh, an extra electron to it through the nuclear bombardments of neutrons, you change the atomic weight of the element. And so that element, and there's thousands of them now that are created during man-made elements, the sun doesn't create them. The sun cr- uh, creates the elements, we destroy them. And so these elements, nothing on the planet has ever encountered it before. Nothing in the food chain all the way up through it has ever encountered it. And it has an adverse reaction immediately in the human bodies or mammals or animals, and particularly um, microscopic animals. It's very devastating to them. And what's going on is that when you ingest an atom, it takes 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years for a cancer to manifest, to be diagnosed, to become a heart tumor. It's a very long process anyway. But when you start ingesting many of these atoms... Uh, and you will get a cancer from them, no matter how small it is, because it has this extra electron atomic weight added onto it, and it's not from this universe anymore. These are that's why we have terrorist laws. That's why we have waste repository sites and nuclear regulatory agencies. It's because we recognize the elements that we create as being uh, a harmful to everything else uh, that's indigenous to this uh, solar system, not just planet Earth. Um, and so that's really something bizarre. And that's why we have weapons about space laws so that you don't put these weapons actually into space. Even though we know what we do, we do put them on satellites and send them to other planets. There is laws where people try to not do that. And so when we released it in such a large amount at Chernobyl, Ireland, Scotland, UK, you still can't sell land, deer that was contaminated from Chernobyl, and you still can't eat. Uh, meat or drink some of the milk in those places not just Europe uh, because radiation followed contaminated the entire European countries now um, Kofi Annan in 2000 said there was 3,000 children that were being treated because of Chernobyl 3 million I'm sorry children being treated from and a lot of these will die a lot of these will have uh, huge problems their entire life and it cost an enormous amount of sacrifices by their loved ones and themselves to deal with these autoimmune deficiencies associated with radioactive materials. And it's well known through studies on dogs. Dr. Raymond Gilmitty from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico has 94 peer-reviewed academic studies on beagle dogs and beagle puppies. And so that's not a very nice subject for people, I know. But he's still doing those studies of plutonium, americium, neptunium on these animals. And what he showed was that within three years, on a study of 144 dogs, 94 of them had uh, bone tumors within the first three years and lung tumors uh, and other tumors to all the dogs within four to five years. Now, dog studies, he correlates it that, you know, you can extract it as a human problem immediately under those pretexts. Now, all the reactors in Japan have plutonium into it. And so 94 studies shown that it kills the dogs no, no matter how small of a dose they got. Uh, is significant because a gram of this stuff produces more atoms in every grain of sand on every beach on every planet, on this planet, <laughs> on every planet, on every beach. And when you're talking about 5 million pounds versus a gram, you're talking about an invisible snowstorm. So California, for instance, had 1,500 of these sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs uh, phenomenons show up per cubic meter of air. And a cubic meter of air is roughly, you know, the where you're stood up to. And so if you're breathing in that, you're breathing in more than one particle at a time and they will sequester in your organs. But generally, plutonium, it likes your bones too, more particular. Now, but Dana, can I just jump in there? Go ahead. Yeah. So what we're saying is, now you have to bear in mind, uh, and I'm not patronising you when I say this. No, no, it's okay. You're, you're, you're really smart and you understand this. I'm, right. I'm Joe Soap, me. Some of these terms I don't right. understand. What, sure. are, what are we saying? We know that it was catastrophic what happened in March 2011. From what I just heard there, you're saying is that people right. in, in British Columbia, say people in Seattle, people in California, people in Mexico, they're in serious trouble right now. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. 
Yes. Uh, and so I'm just trying to build it because I know we got 30 minutes. Yeah. And you can you can interject any time with. Any yeah, and I don't like that. doing that because I'm I'm absolutely okay. gripped by what you're saying, uh, Dana. And, and so you should be. And and that's the importance of it uh, is that now. The majority of this would have fell out in the ocean, but it gets reliberated with rain. And there's tens of thousands of miles of rain picked up off the ocean every day. And that's distributed to all the continents around the planet. This stuff, when it hits the upper and lower uh, tropos troposphere, it takes about 10 years to rain out. But it went much higher than that. And so forest fires in the Asian Pacific, for instance, have been modeled as pollution indexes in other countries, particularly North America and Ireland, Scotland, and you know just right around the entire planet. So a forest fire is a great big particle. These particles I'm talking about are one ten thousand the size. But because they're created in a forest fire, they're so hot, they go very high and they're distributed for a very long time. And they take many years to rain out on top of that. But they do go right around this entire planet in about 40 days and continue to do that for many years until they're rained out. But the radiation keeps, because it's so small, it keeps being re-liberated and it hovers at ground level on top of that. Now, so what we done was we covered 9,000 headlines about this, and then we put together an operation. We flushed out every aspect of it to make sure it was real. And then we, we put together an operation to go out and look at the coastline and see if we can notice any kind of impact, because that was where you would normally would go. Originally, you would go look at the microscopic world and not at the whales, not at the porpoises, not at the tunas, because they're so far up the food chain. Not that you shouldn't look at them, but it's just that originally you would go look at the microscopic world. If there was damage, then you would look at every other part of the marine food chain out there. And so what we've done is 15,000 miles, and out of that 15,000 miles was 260 days of the 365 on the ocean, up to five months without getting home. And because the damage was so uh, severe, we had to see if this was symmetrically through the entire coast of Canada. And so the last expedition, I just finally finished it, five expeditions altogether, was six weeks on the West Coast. And that, that was the definitive answer when I finished that one. And that was also the entire coastline was wiped out. And so I'll just break that down for everybody in about a three-minute run and it's coming at you quite quick, I know, and it's quite devastating, but you have to uh, listen to the whole interview. And, and I'll yeah, and we'll, I'm, and we'll get you back for a part two. Just before you, you, you go into this three minutes about the expedition and what you saw, I want to do a okay. very quick recap. Dana yes. Dornford is on the line to us live from British uh, Columbia. I've had a good look at this man over the last few weeks, as I should do as a producer and presenter. Uh, and he's credible. He is credible beyond um, any words I can say to say he's credible. Uh, he uh, is an expert in what nuclear uh, fallout does to the environment, to the sea, to the air, to the land. He's an adventurer. He's a sailor. He's been looking at this since it happened. He's been back-checking his facts against what happened in Chernobyl and what happened elsewhere over the years. This is absolutely serious stuff, this. It isn't fear-mongering. It isn't playing that silly game that some alternative news programmes do. Uh, this doomsday, end-of-the-world nonsense. It's none of that. This is the stuff that's not been uh, disseminated on national and commercial media because they're burying it. They are burying this. We know this to be absolutely true. Dana, by the way, Dana's website is thenuclearproctologist.org. Thenuclearproctologist.org. Right, my friend, what have you seen on these expeditions when you're out at sea? What are you seeing? Talk to us about uh, the wildlife. Talk to us about the birds, the animals, what you would expect to see, what you're not expecting to see. The floor is yours. Okay, really, really, really good setup. Thank you, Richie. So, folks, this is tough, to, I'm sure, for anybody who loves the ocean or just loves life itself. Now, British Columbia is unique, and it has 26,000 islands. And in that 26,000 islands, there's an established residential population of marine invertebrates and life, and floras and flannas and insects and birds and shellfish. And so I had to encompass all of that. Normally, a researcher will go out and just study one bird or one insect or one flana or, or such and such. I had to encompass it all because it was all missing. And so what was missing was 5,600 species. But in comparison, that's just a generalization of the species. And there's 4 million in the Pacific Ocean altogether. But they consider many, 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 many researches over the many decades of the coastline that showed this many to be the residential. And these numbers are 600 algaes, which are kelps, 
and you would expect to find four to five hundred in any tidal pool at it, no matter where you went. And then you would get 70 sponges, 70 species of sponges. You would get 76 species of starfish. You would get 78 species of sea anemones. And remember, these all comes in very bright, different colors per species. So when you're talking, so now you would have around 50, uh, 6,500 species of the invertebrates without the backbones. You would have all the shellfish, the snails, the mollas, the periwinkles. You would end up with all the mussels, the mollas would cover every single rock that it can get onto in herds. On top of this, that is the, where the nursery itself of the Pacific Ocean is too. And so the sunlight penetrates the ocean for the first 30 feet very significant you still get your colors but after that you get shades of gray and i was a commercial diver for 14 years in both oceans and so i I, I, six hours a day on the ocean floor so i have and i ran 14 commercial operations in the ocean and i I have a unique perspective of that and because i had a company years ago eight years ago called marine channel productions limited where i foresaw thousands of cameras underwater and i was actively trying to do that and the species, uh, there's not, not there's 100 species left on the coastline out of the 5,600 residential. and But the underwater footage was shocking also. The coastline underwater footage showed that all the shellfish were missing. Now, a shellfish, like a mussel, for instance, when it dies, the, the shell opens up. It's a very visible thing. And so as the camera's going underwater, we don't see any shellfish down there. This is the most bizarre thing that anybody can even imagine because the beaches are made of shellfish uh, shells over millenniums. So how can you have shellfish beaches without shellfish is, is, is a really startling observation. Did you expect to see that or did that come as a right. massive shock to you? That was the, one of the, probably the biggest shock besides the insects were missing along the entire coastline and the bird species. There was supposed to be 148 uh, residential and 167 migratory, and out of the, all the species, I've only counted 11 of bird species, but none of them were in the herds or, or in population wises. And in context of that, on my last expedition, I ran to the very north of Canada, to the border of Alaska, which, and I'm right down at the south end of Canada, and I counted 400 birds. Now, every mile I should count 1,000 to 5,000 birds and many varieties of them. But also during the trip, I was there when the phytoplankton was supposed to bloom and the krill was supposed to come in. These are the bases of the food chain, the oxygen, and the carbon sequestering chain on this planet. Excuse me, 50% of the oxygen is produced by the phytoplankton. There was no evidence of that at all. And during the, the major season, I shouldn't be able to see more than two feet below the boat. And my underwater camera footage was perfect all the way to the ocean floor the whole time. And so and at nighttime, I would leave. I have a daylight system on the boat for nighttime. And you couldn't get enough krill to come into the light or any other species to to really get pictures on the water. It was absolutely still. uh, Most of the anchorages, and I stayed by myself out there for up to five months of time, where there was literally no birds at any given time except for about four different times where I was anchored to. And these are, it was lonely and quiet. Now, startling enough, as I went ashore into these 26,000 islands, because I would take bats in the rivers at the low tide zones, or high tide zones, and I wasn't finding any spiders in the woods, and I wasn't finding uh, any birds in the woods. And so uh, the picture now, to wrap this all together for us, is getting even worse, as if that's not bad enough. We now have no snow in our mountains. And so the tritium was an enormous amount. Canada now has 7,000 becquels in a litre of water for our drinking water standards, and they never announced why that is. But that's 7 million becquels of uh, tritium. Now, tritium got a 12 and a half year half life, and half lives are times 10. That's how they obfuscate it all the time, is by always not telling you the other side of that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now, with no snow in the mountains, the snow in British Columbia, all these mountains, uh, would regulate the, the outlets, the streams, the salmon rivers, and everything with cold water all summer long to keep the temperatures regulated. And so that wasn't there this year. And of course, that snow took snowpack took thousands of years to produce the tritium doesn't allow the ice to crystallize in the mountains and now it's missing we've never seen that in the history of this planet and that's borne out by because the entire coast of that, that's right now we we go out on commercial radio on fab radio so there will be people listening to this 
and they'll be sceptical. Speak to sure. them, Dana. Speak to them. Absolutely. Because cause they're going to say, come on, we'd have heard about this. This would have been in the news. Why is it not in the news? Uh, it's a trillion dollar a year industry. There's a million corporations depending upon it, all nations. But the biggest reason for it is the future is laser weapons and that's tied directly to the isotopes. So the more crazier the isotope you can produce, the more deadlier the lasers, the future generations of lasers can be. And so they can't give up the technology without giving up the laser technology at the same time. They can only do so much with the ruby uh, that they use for the lasers. And so lasers, a lot of people don't even accept that, but it's got just celebrated its 50-year anniversary. We were cutting three feet of steel 50 years ago with lasers. Who knows what they're really doing? As I'm sure you covered many times, everything we see is obsolete technology. But, I mean, if they find out this, what I'm saying is pertinent and real, and it's impossible to, to uh, take that away, and unfortunately, uh, they lose all their pensions. Uh, immediately, plus they lose the respect of their uh, friends, families, loved ones, acquaintances, neighbors, and they lose that prominence. And they also will be vilified uh, just outlandishly in every context of that word because you can't hide the death of the Pacific Ocean. The mass die offs already we've seen the herring are gone, the anchovies are gone, the shrimp are gone, the crustaceans are gone, the krill is gone, uh, mackerel is gone, the squid is gone. And so these are the migratory feeders. These are, and everything I cover is, like I said before, I went on the ocean, I covered 9,000 headlines. So it's not me. And I use all academic studies. I had 25,000 supporting documentations before we launched it on the ocean. And we done that in frustration that nobody had went into the proper places to do the studies. Instead, they were postulating about how much radiation the tuna would pick when it pick up with as it went past Japan. But the ocean current travels at five miles an hour at 24 hours times 45 days, that's 5,500 miles. So the first plume gets here in 45 days, and every day behind is a plume behind it. But taken into the context of Chernobyl, stopped after 10 days, and Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. These things were three times the size. These were 100% meltdowns. Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. And these reactors are now breeder reactors. And so that as they're consuming the rocks and the cement and the rebar every time you have a tremor down or, or rocks that fall down or they, they land on, uh, they produce ionized radioactive elements and they are ejected into the ocean and into the atmosphere. And so even if we were to stop the reactors in Japan right now, we can't save the Pacific Ocean. And so they can't hide this much longer. Uh, they were hoping that the ocean would you know, dilute it, but you can't dilute radiation. You can only disperse it. It has millions of years of half-life. And the problem was that the reactors were using fuel. They, what they were doing was reclaiming plutonium, reclaiming uranium from missiles from the silos from the Cold War. And so this stuff is already 2 million times worse than it was originally because it went through a chain reaction. That's what it does. And when you put it through a chain reaction again and you have a detonation, everything is a hot particle because it's 2 billion times worse than what it was originally. And that's how the math works with this. Before you put it through the chain reaction, you can pick it up in your hand. After, a pound will kill everybody, 1,500 people in 20 minutes. It'll kill everybody in the front row in a minute and everybody in the back row. That's a pound of it. But if you atomize an aerosol, it, you're talking a gram of it is more uh, atoms in every grain of sand on every beach on the planet. So it doesn't take long for this stuff to show up in the microscopic world because there was so much came out of there because there's so much coming out of there constantly and because we only sent in the homeless, the destitute, the victims of society. You do you remember that? See- Holy shit. Excuse me for swearing, but do you remember no, okay. that? We reported that at TPV in London that they were sending in. They were getting homeless men. They were getting sick men to go in there. Right. Then yeah, I just want to read some tweets, right? Because a uh, massive ahead. amount of tweets have come in and then... I've got some more questions here. Um, staggering stuff. Dana Dornford is on the line to us from British Columbia. It's 17 minutes to the top of the hour. Emlyn was on to say on Twitter, we have three more mega reactors coming to the UK. Hinkley Point, Somerset to start in the coming weeks, uh, producing power by 2025. I think Emlyn is disgusted uh, by that, as am I. Mike was on to ask, does Dana know about Ivan McFadden and the ocean is broken? He sailed yes. between Japan and California. I'm sure uh, Dana 
saying it does. I'm going to quickly go through a few more of these because I'll get all the hassle later on, Dan, if we're not reading them. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, Val Kyrie on Twitter says, by the time the children grow up, all the animals will be dead. If it's not sooner than that. Uh, just moving along. Uh, loads and loads of comments from Joanne, from Ronnie. Thanks for all your tweets and all your messages. Uh, Karen in Glasgow in Scotland says, this is awful. Andrea was on to say that after Chernobyl, there was a 10-year ban on uh, taking mushrooms out of the ground. Uh, she still wouldn't do it. Mushrooms can't be found there anymore, uh, says Andrea. Alan was on to say, uh, this is an email from Alan. He says, Richie, the Pacific Ocean is around about 65 million square miles. Is Dana really saying that every species in 65 million square miles is in irreversible decline? Is it, Dana? Four million species are, yeah. Because what happened was... If we took out the 5,600 indigenous species on the coastline, the other 4 million would fill up that gap immediately. The ocean didn't recede itself, see? It didn't recede the coastline. So if I went down, plowed in a healthy coastline, it would recede itself from stuff down deeper and on both sides of it. The ocean didn't do it. I documented it on my site, so I don't know what to say to them, but... Yeah. Carl- now, what happens is it comes over, it hits the mountains, it washes back down to the coastline on top of that. And so maybe it's the coastline is so radioactive, life can't take there. But on the other side of that one is, how come I couldn't find the phytoplankton when I was out there for five months during the bloom? And why did Canada try to create an artificial phytoplankton bloom two years ago? John Disney in Mass at Queen Charlotte got almost $3 million to create an artificial bloom. So if a glass of salt water would have 75 to 100 million phytoplankton and a billion other creatures and eggs and larvae, how come the ocean didn't recede the coastline was the postulation that I, I used, yeah. Carl is in Canberra, Australia, and asked, why is the west coast of Canada and US being affected so badly? Now, that leads into uh, another question from Fiona, and that's on Twitter. Fiona is listening in uh, in <coughs> Manchester. And uh, let me just bring that up. Um, Fiona says, depending on who you believe, there are several hundred or several thousand gallons of contaminated wastewater still pouring into the Pacific Ocean every day. We're not hearing the truth in the media, obviously, asks Fiona. Please ask Dana, what's the truth? Dana, what is the truth? How many thousands or hundreds of gallons of contaminated uh, groundwater, wastewater, whatever you want to call it, are still pouring into the sea every day? They're pouring water in on the reactor constantly, <clears throat> but now, you've got to think about the dispersals when the original detonation happened. These were very heavy dispersals. And what they done was as they cleaned up uh, Japan, if you want to call it that, they were dumping it into the rivers and the estuaries and the lakes. And so this stuff will, will put out beckles every second. This stuff will split atoms and create its own isotopes, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at the same time, they're digging up uh, communities. They're taking it to other prefectures and then burning it incinerators and so this stuff is created at five six seven thousand degree fahrenheit temperatures three thousand fahrenheit uh, incinerators is not going to harm it you're just going to re-liberate it immediately back into the environment and i've had flushed this out with many many uh, headlines from different uh, medias about it over the last number of years and it seems that they're they're intent on burning about a billion um, tons of radioactive debris this way and so we connect, it's, it's just going to get worse. But the reactors themselves are hemorrhaging all of them. They're pouring water on it. The basements were broken. So it runs over, the water runs over the fuel product, not counting what the rain, typhoons, and snow does to this pla- these places. It washes it back down into the ocean. And think about everything around it is getting radiated at the same time. And that's getting washed into the environment too. And so it's a perpetual breeder machines. This is what this is why we have the nuclear regulatory that this stuff doesn't go that way, where it doesn't become unhinged and, and be able to create its own. That's why we worry about dirty bombs in the community, of course, is because this stuff is so dangerous, even in low qualities. But, you know, if they have an accident, all of a sudden it's like a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine. And so it's that direct conflict but everything that's happening in Japan generally immediately comes towards North America within three or four days in the jet stream, and it's still going. But under those plants is a huge river. They built it on an old river bed. It's bedrock. It's been there for a thousand years. The river wore it down to the bedrock, and they put the plant above this about 100 feet. 
And so everything that goes down gets washed out from that old riverbed. You can't stop an old riverbed even with a structure above it. And so it's being flushed out. Now, that is their backup plan. They do that no matter where they put a nuclear power plant. But let's add in one more thing before I let Richie jump back in there. The most important part of this is that that tsunami ran across 500 miles of the coastline. And that that tsunami not only took out Fukushima, it took out all the nuclear power plants on the coastline. They just didn't report on it. And the only power plants they're going to reopen are the ones inland or on the other side of Japan, not on the open ocean side, because they all melted down, burnt down. They lost their inventories, their, um, their storage, their fuel pools on the land. There was an enormous amount of this material. It wasn't reported. Once again, the mixed oxide fuel... At number three alone makes Fukushima two million times worse than any other current reactor on this planet. Now, uh, and because go ahead. Sorry, I got to ask you this: two questions. One, are uh, Japanese fish being sold in Europe today that yes. might not be safe? Number one, but number two, and this has been bugging me because I'm, I, I understand everything you've said. What are fishermen off the coast of Canada and off the coast of? Uh, the western, I should say, the western seaboard of Canada and the United States. What are they catching, Dana? Yeah, they're catching fish because fish are farther up the food chain, right? And so fish are still hanging on. Whales are still hanging on. But the 38 whales that died on the coastline, just digress one second, they were all krill eaters. They starved to death. The mass die off of the birds and the mammals on the coastline, they had starved to death because they're, they're not, they're, uh, so the Squid failed, the anchovies failed, the herring failed, all the these industry failed. And so fish are basically cannibalizing each other at this stage. The whales, and they were all emaciated. All the bird die-offs, the auklets, they were dependent upon krill. They were all emaciated. And we have endless reports now of mass die-offs. And scientists are starting to ask that question. Maybe it is Fukushima. But... Because to cover up, you can't get a job in the industry without being part of the good old boys club. You can't be out speaking in the media. And so why don't we get nuclear scientists out speaking about this? Why do we get marine chemists? Why don't we get marine biologists? And, you know, these are questions that people need to ask themselves because the only two people that are allowed to speak, of course, are the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's frontman, that's Jay right. Cullen that's right. and Ken Busler. And that's all you really truly hear about. But um, It's funny you say me. that, Dana, because you hear those guys on Sky and on the BBC as well, those same guys. You just right. don't get another just opinion. Just two of them, yeah. This programme uh, has um, listeners with a variety of opinions. One of the prevailing opinions on disasters like these uh, are uh, that sometimes these are deliberately created. And some of our listeners will think that man-made weather technology... Um, has been used and all of that. Now, I don't know whether you're interested in any of that or whether it's occurred to you. It doesn't necessarily um, have to be talked or spoken about today. Um, but is it something you've ever considered? Have you heard these theories? What do you make of them? Well, uh, in Vietnam, they made it rain, rain over the Ho Chi Minh Trail for an extra couple of months washing your bridges and communities with weather uh, weaponized clouds. I know in Britain... Um, Previous, about 10 years before that, they finally admitted to washing out a community with weather uh, warfare technology. And that Vietnam, we chemtrailed chem sky also for nine years. Uh, so this technology was already uh, refined. They weren't going to get rid of it. And we know HARP is real. I've seen interviews on these people. They have benign reasons for using it and but they do admit that under the wrong guise it could be used as a weapon and that that, that manifestation has showed up throughout this planet and that we know other countries have these same technologies and that yeah it just keeps replicating anything bad they'll replicate it right away everywhere else apparently uh, so uh, when it comes to Japan there, there's uh, major speculations and we can you know some other show we can definitely go way down the road on that I can certainly contribute to it in my um I can back up certain documentation yeah, about it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, we'll definitely do a follow-up on that. We will. But, you know, we've had guests on the programme before who've put forward uh, those series, but your background is so interesting and so unique. Thank you. Uh, for Thank you to be saying you. that, Dana, you know. i got to say again, folks. I studied to, up on it. You've read up on it. You, I mean, you've been out there. You've been on the ocean. It's the nuclearproctologist.org. Dana, what do you want listeners to this programme to do with this information? What can anybody do? 
Well, first off, you if you had a million people call up uh, you, Vic, and tell them to fire Jay Cullen, we wouldn't have to listen to him no more. And the next guy would be definitely wouldn't be saying those that stuff again because we can have a million people. So we can we can get rid of the apologists, dethrone them, and so that's how you would do it. And then you would you would try to level out the playing field with somebody that's a bit more talking about the subject instead of avoiding the subject. And once again, what we got to do as a sign of good fate is to pass out natural seeds of food throughout all the communities and because that has the nutrients in it. And I'm sure your audience is aware of the genetically modified critters out there you got to avoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they call it food. I call it critters. And because they engineered out uh, all the mineral, micro, macro nutrients to tiny parts per million and engineered in uh, uh, toxins and dioxins and glossopates and formaldehydes that up pro- prohibit you from uptaking nutrients. And so even if you have a chocolate bar and a really good meal of no uh, GMO, you still have a hard time uptaking nutrients. So if everybody was to get rid of the GMO, if we were to plant organic foods throughout all of our communities instead of using pesticides, and everything else and mowing lawns, we plant really natural food, healthy food. We can extend the life of the insect world, the, the, the mammal world, the animal world, the human world, and everybody else just a little bit longer till we come up with some kind of technology. But we do need to go to work on coming up with technologies to, to filter our water, our food, and to, to – we've got to get rid of the GMOs to sign a good fate, you know. The planet got half a chance. But on the path we're doing right now, we're already looking 100% – at an unchangeable extinction event of the Pacific Ocean, it ain't going to get any better. We're next, you know. We're up that food chain, and we are consuming everything that is bioaccumulating it. The studies on the dogs, the beagle dogs and the beagle puppies, are not uh, wrong. They're, they're, and there's a thousand other institutions doing those studies too. And so they show definitively what this stuff is going to do to us, and we see the documentation already. It's very frightening. It's very concerning. But first off, we dethrone these people then we shut them all down and we come up with alternative sources and resources and filtration systems and try to come up with a way forward. I don't have those answers uh, specifically. It would take me a few hours, but I do yeah. have some yeah, really good ways forward, I think. Do us a favor, Dana. We've got to leave it there for now. Okay. Um, come back in a few weeks' time. And, and I don't mean the longer end of a few weeks. I mean the shorter end of a few weeks. Come back and spend an hour on the program. Come back and do an extended interview with us. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. To, it. It, to say it's important is a ludicrous understatement. It's yeah. the nuclearproctologist.org. Org. Get on there Get immediately. Uh, Dana, look, uh, you've done a lot of these interviews today. Thanks very much for coming on and talking to us, my friend. Do come yeah. back again in the next two to three weeks. You're more than welcome. And, um, Absolutely. And, and, I'm looking forward to it, Richie. Marvellous. And we'll just leave it there for now. Thanks, Dana. Dana Dornford on the line to us there from British Columbia. There's a nuclearproctologist.org is his website. I don't know what to say after that. I really don't.